started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Overwintering and Care for uh, your houseplants and tropicals. Uh, my name is Danny. Uh, usually Sally is running these webinars, but uh, she's having some internet problems all the way down in Florida. Uh, so I am uh, taking up the mantle today. Uh, today we have Amy Jones here, um, who is going to be talking about over, uh, overwintering and care for your houseplants and tropical. Um, we're gonna have about a 30 to 40 minute presentation um, in which you guys can ask questions and we're going to uh, uh, answer those questions, some of those questions during the presentation and then we'll have some time after the presentation as well um, to answer more questions. Now, for those of you who have not done one of our webinars, webinars before, uh, we cannot see or hear you, um, but you can ask your questions in the Q&A tab um, that's down usually at the bottom of your screen. You just click that um, and then type your question. I'll see it and then I can forward that question to Amy. Um, so if you have any other questions by the time that, they, that the webinar is over that didn't get answered, um, feel free to go to our website, www.maryfieldgardencenter.com, and you can ask a question via, via the contact us form, or you can also send Sally Burroughs a question uh, through her email address, which is sburrows at mgcmail.com. So without for any further ado, uh, I'm gonna take it over to Amy. All right, everyone, hello. I'm Amy, as you know, he mentioned. Uh, I work at the Gallows Road uh, Greenhouse at Maryfield Garden Center, um, and I, have a passion for tropicals in a way that is pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> the, the main thing we're talking about today is gonna be keeping your houseplants through the winter time, keeping them healthy through the winter time. Um, so just the things to look out for and to avoid, particularly for certain guys that are more sensitive um, and just kind of just enjoying houseplants, even when, uh, when everything outside is not gonna be as green and flowery and you can have some nice green stuff inside that's still thriving around you, that's kind of the main goal. So we're gonna jump right into this. Um, so the main thing when you're going to the winter season, at least for our particular area of the world in the uh, like mid-Atlantic kind of region, um, the main thing is that the light is going to be decreasing significantly. So like if you have a south or western facing window that gets light for like six hours of the day, sometimes in the spring and summertime, um, in the wintertime going through the fall and especially as like daylight savings changes, I mean, that won't actually change plants getting light, but we're going to be up at different hours and that kind of thing too. Um, they, it's going to just be a lot less intense because the sun is literally going to go away from the part of the earth that we're at for quite a while. So it's just the available light is going to be a lot less. Um, so for plants that like a lot of direct sunlight, um, you really want to try to get them as close up into the sunniest window you have in the wintertime, unless that window is particularly drafty and that plant is really sensitive. Um, so for example, I've got this little ficus Audrey girl here. Um, super cute ficus trees. I really love a lot. Um, they're really variable in the types of looks that they have. The uh, temperament is a little more advanced sometimes. They're a little more sensitive to drafts, um, watering inconsistencies. Um, they do like a good amount of direct sun if possible. Um, so that is going to, as also help to keep them with their immune system strongest so that they can um, fight off any kind of pests or diseases better. Um, but these guys, they're, they're somewhat sensitive to any kind of cold drafts. Um, so I definitely, if you have this guy in a window that's a little less insulated, would maybe pull him back just a little bit, like a foot or two, um, or even like if you have like a vent that's going to be blowing heat directly onto the plant, you can get like a vent director where you just, it's a pretty much a plastic screw kind of thing that you put into the ceiling that will direct the air away from the plant. Um, it also helps with other like air movement in the house too sometimes if it doesn't tend to circulate super well. Um, but yeah, that can be really helpful for more sensitive plants like this guy who will drop leaves very regularly if there's a lot of cold drafts going on or even dry heat drafts. Um, that's really going to put a lot of stress on plants leaves because they're going to be losing more moisture through their leaves than they had been previously. Um, and especially when you're going from growing a plant outside in the spring and summertime, when you go to bring it inside for the winter, um, the change in the nice hum humidity, the regular rains, all of that going to a dry kind of heat 
artificial situation is pretty stressful on these guys. Um, and with ficus trees, I've seen them drop more than half of their leaves sometimes when you bring them in um, and you're not doing any kind of thing to mitigate the humidity and the, uh, the light or the airflow that they're receiving still. Um, but it's not the end of the world that is kind of typical for them in new situations to drop a lot of leaves. Um, but then they can regrow. Absolutely. Just chop them back a little if they're kind of bare and they'll just respark from wherever you chop them to. Um, but yeah, that's uh, one of the main things about the uh, sensitive plants and uh, having them in the wintertime near draftier windows or heating vents. You just, you want to kind of keep them a little bit away. Um, so like, for instance, this guy here, the snake plant, um, this one has a very tough leaf. Um, the leaves are very waxy, very thick. They're not going to be losing a lot of moisture through their leaves like a plant like a ficus would be that has much larger visible pores on the leaf. Um, these you really can't see pores whatsoever. You'd have to get to a microscopic level. Um, but these guys, you could have these near a pretty warm, drafty kind of situation, and they're really not going to be too affected. Um, so if you have plants, um, a, a really fun thing that you can do in the winter is kind of rearrange your house plants a little bit so that they can get the best light that they need, but so also that they're not going to be in situations that's going to be overly stressful to them, like the, uh, the dry air being blown on them all the time. Um, these guys, if you had this guy, in a space before that was, you know, somewhat brighter, so or even lower light, and then you had to move this guy away from a spot that was pretty bright, um, just to, even to the other side of the same bench that they were on. So he's still getting similar light. Um, this one would be able to tolerate a lot more drafts going on. So that's a it's a really good way to kind of move your plants around, still have a plant in the same space that you like having a plant, but it's one that can tolerate that kind of situation a little bit better for that part of the year. Um, and it's always nice. I like to kind of move plants around just to have a little bit of a new fresh feeling for the different seasons. You can kind of get fun with the decorations with them. And um, it, I just, I really love having a, a variety of plants that you can move around for that exact purpose. Cause they probably won't be happy year round in the same space. Um, just year after year after year, things are going to be changing. Like for instance, um, in front of my house, it used to be really sunny. Like if you sat in front of the South facing window, it used to like get hot on your back if you were sitting there. But now there's so many trees that have grown up that it's pretty shady that I have to actually put a ton of grow lights in my room in order to actually get the light adequate for most plants. Um, so it, things will change over time. It's totally cool to be expected. Um, and it's part of the fun of it, honestly, because you always get to, you know, see how things look in different situations, even maybe get a new friend out of the whole situation. All right. So another plant that's pretty sensitive to dry air kind of situations are going to be any kind of fern or plant that has a very thin leaf. Um, if you kind of shake this guy around, it kind of sounds like it's even a little bit dry. Um, and these guys are just, they don't have much as far as maintaining moisture in their leaves in drier air. Um, so even in like a normal home situation, it can sometimes be hard to grow ferns just because they really love a high humidity in the air kind of situation. Um, so for these guys, I have no problem growing them outside all summer. They get huge, they get beautiful. Um, but then when I go to bring them inside, even in like a bathroom situation, I, I have found that they can tend to really start to die back pretty regularly. I usually expect for this plant um, of my own at home to lose about half the fronds that it has in the winter time that it had when I first brought it in from the summer, just due to the drier air. Um, I have quite a few plants. So when I go to bring them in, they don't always end up in the best lighting situation as well. So that will also really impact um, the available, the the plant keeping leaves on like it did in the summertime. Um, so for these guys, they do thin out pretty significantly. Most of my ferns typically do thin a little bit in the winter just because they're not able to support as many fronds as they had in the lower humidity, um, but that's totally okay. I've always found that in the spring and summer with a little extra humidity and love, they tend to really just regrow like crazy. Um, even if they've gotten really bare, I like to put them outside just once it's warm in the summer and then they tend to really grow like four times as big as they did when I first put them out from the winter time. Um, and it's just, it's really fun to watch these guys grow after being put through multiple situations, not necessarily bad situations, but definitely you can see the difference in their growth habit um, in higher humidity, higher humidity environments versus lower humidity ones. Um, so for the ferns, um, a really great way to kind of mitigate humidity if you don't have, if you don't want to have to put like a humidifier up in the room is to do a humidity tray, um, which is literally just like a piece of plastic that has like a little bit of a lip. It can be like a shallow bowl. It can be like a bonsai tray kind of thing. Um, and then I fill that tray with a very shallow layer of rocks. And then you can put a little bit of water so that the rock 
um, the water layer is not over the rocks, but that the plant sits on top of the rocks and doesn't quite touch the water. And then it'll always be evaporating around the plant. Um, and that really helps to create a localized humidity situation for the um, plants that are really particular about that. Um, so like ferns, orchids, thinner leaves, sensitive houseplants like calatheas and prayer plants. Um, all of those guys really would appreciate that kind of extra help in the winter when our um, heating systems are working so hard to help to keep the, um, the air warm enough in the house. Um, so the ferns, main thing is keeping the humidity up. Um, watering may be slightly less, um, but it also might be slightly more often depending on how warm it is and the heat and airflow in your home. Um, so just keep an eye on it. Um, for most plants, you will find that you're gonna be watering a little less often than you would in the spring and summer. Um, plants, even though they're tropicals, so tropicals in nature, they will grow pretty much year round. Um, a lot of the tropicals we grow as house plants are grown around the, um, grow naturally around the equator. So they're really not getting so much of a winter light shift as we experience in our areas. Um, however, they still will react differently when they do experience a winter situation. So even though they don't naturally die back in the winter or may have a similar growth habit year round in nature, um, when you go to grow these inside the home and in a place that does experience winter, um, you can't expect the growth to really slow down. Watering is going to be a little bit less just because the plant's not going to be using quite as much water for the most part. Um, and then you may have to supplement with humidity as well to kind of keep the same growth rate up, but still expect it to be a little bit lower than in the spring and summertime. Um, and that's typically just due to the availability of the light. Some plants really do like to take a true resting period in the wintertime. Um, so like elephant ears, alocasias, um, Plenty of other plants do a full dormancy, like um, oxalis or the clovers, little purple shamrock plants are really notorious for going completely dormant for part of the year. Um, and that's a plant, those plants are um, plants that have a true dormancy period where they lose all of their leaves, they store all of their energy in their root system, and then they can actually just regrow when the conditions arise that are more favorable to growth again. Um, so in the wintertime, Elephant ears, caladiums, those kinds of plants are very hard to try to maintain indoors. Um, I've tried to do it before, but it's just, it's a lot of uh, dealing with pest control. And then even, even then it may just have like one little leaf that kind of hangs on the whole time. Um, and that's totally normal. I typically will, um, if I do just let them be in the pots, just expect it to either have no leaves or just have one kind of leaf hanging out for the winter time. And then when you go to put it back out in the spring and summer, um, then the new leaves just start to grow like crazy again. It wakes up and starts to resume its normal growth habit. Um, but when you're taking a bulb out of the pot, um, so like for elephant ears, I find the best way to store them is to literally, if it's in the ground, you can dig it up completely, or you can just take it out of the pot and get all the old dirt off of it. Um, you do want to trim off the growing point if you're storing it. Um, yes, I will. Um, and so you do want to trim off the growing point when you're storing it in the roots so that there's not going to be a ton of rot and the plant's not going to be trying to keep growing when it's being stored. Um, and then the darkest, most um, dry place you have in the house is going to be the best place to store these guys because any kind of humidity or moisture is going to try to awaken the plant again. Um, and I've lost quite a few bulbs I was storing over the winter before because I put them in the garage and it was too humid. They started to grow when they shouldn't have been. Um, and then I, I, they ended up not having enough winter stores to actually bloom and go through the entire next season. So they just kind of put up a little, a few leaves and then just kind of died back and didn't really do anything that year. Um, it was because they weren't stored properly. Um, so the main thing is um, keeping them very dry, keeping them um, very in a lot of darkness. You can store them in plastic, but make sure you've thoroughly dried them on the counter for about a week before you put them in. Um, you can store them in paper, just in a dry place. Um, sometimes garages, work okay. I have a small greenhouse in my garage, so it does stay a lot more humid, which is why mine didn't work out so well. Um, but yeah, that's that's the main thing is um, just knowing if your plant's going to go completely dormant or not. Now, oxalis is one that really does die back kind of randomly throughout the year. You'll have like a every month or like a month out of each year where it just has no leaves whatsoever. It'll just yellow, it'll just be failing, and then all of a sudden it'll just have no leaves. You'll pick them all off and then you just kind of put it to the side for a month or two and then you look back at it one day and it's just got some new leaves coming out um, and that's totally normal for the oxalis plants because they have a true dormancy period where they just resort um, revert all their energy into their corm or like little root system and then they just regrow whenever the opportunity presents itself and the conditions are correct um, so 
it's not always the end of the world. If your plant starts to die back, it could be totally normal for that species. Um, plenty of houseplants do not, but there's also quite a few ones that do as well. Um, so I had one question about Dracaenas in overwintering those guys, and I find them to be extremely easy to overwinter. Um, I actually have one that's outside still on my front porch. I will probably be bringing it in in the next week or two here. Um, they don't like temperatures below 45, I would say they are a little more cold tolerant than other tropicals, um, but they're they're pretty easy to overwinter. Um, I like to put them in a pretty bright spot still for the winter time so that they can continue to have healthy growth going on. Um, I have found that they don't tend to grow very much in the winter time, um, especially if they're not getting at least a few hours of very bright light, um, but they tend to just kind of really just not use a lot a lot of water. You could even go every three to four weeks with your watering schedule, as long as it's going thoroughly dry and then you're giving it a really good soak once it reaches total dryness. Um, they definitely will back off on that. Um, and then fertilizer, you really don't want um, to have to fertilize any of the foliage plants during the winter whatsoever, unless they're showing active signs of nutrient deficiency, um, which is gonna look like, it, could, it looks like a very wide variety of things depending on which nutrient is deficient. Um, but if you've been fertilizing in the spring and summer, like using an extended release one, Osmocote, when you water in, um, you probably will not have to fertilize in the winter time or the fall even whatsoever um, if the plant's in a, an appropriate pot size and has been cared for prior to that point. Um, now, if you pick the plant up and you don't know when it was last repotted, you don't know what the fertilizer schedule was like around this time of year, um, then I always like to take a look at the root system and see how it really is doing. So like this snake plant here is a really good example of that because he is busting at the seams. Um, so I'm gonna wiggle him out of the pot here. This one's called Night Owl. I really love them. Um, and these guys are technically in the Dracaena genus now. They used to be Sansevieria, um, but now they've looked at the flower structures and found that they're super similar. So they're actually gonna be treated similarly to the um, Dracaenas in the home environment, a little less water because they do store quite a bit more in their roots and in their leaves. Um, but if we look at this guy's root system, if we were gonna pick this guy up today, I would take him out just because I can't get my finger into the soil. If I can't move soil around on the top and I can't get my finger to, down into the, the root system, then it probably is pretty pot bound. Um, so when I take this guy out, he's got a pup that's busting on the side right here. Um, this one is going straight up like a line. It doesn't have much room to expand out. So he would definitely want to go up into a larger pot size before going through the entire winter season. Um, now it's not gonna kill this plant or even really hurt it too badly. To in the same pot size. So like if you really didn't want to have to repot it, you could wait till the spring. Um, but this one here will start to, when it starts to come out, it'll start getting pinched on the side. Um, so these side leaves that are babies here may get a little bit damaged um, just because they were up against the pot as they were trying to grow. Um, now they still will absolutely grow even if the pot is too small, um, but it'll just, it'll impact the growth habit a little more. So for this guy, I probably wouldn't want to make him go through the entire winter in this, the same pot here, just because it doesn't really give him enough room to expand out for the new pups that he's still growing. Um, so you could either take this plant, divide it into two. So I would take like these guys and just break them off. You would take like a knife um, or even like a shovel and just go right down the center. And then the root systems, you can kind of separate pretty easily on these guys. Um, or you could just go up to like a six or seven inch pot size. He's in about a five right now. So I go up about two inches um, and then just cactus and succulent soil, very well draining, sandy kind of soil matter. Um, and that's gonna give them at least enough room to go a full another year in that pot size. And then if you need to repot again by springtime, you may, it's not, common for these guys to grow that quickly to need multiple repots in a single year. Um, but, you know, just pay attention to the plant, what the root system's looking like, how the growth is doing. Um, if it seems like it's kind of pot bound, but it's been growing really, really well, I always like to just kind of let it be. You can always, in the winter time, if the plant absolutely needs repotting, um, if it's per se, like it's fallen out of its pot, or if like a piece of it broke off, or if uh, it's literally like the pot breaks because it's busting at the side, then it's absolutely okay to repot during the winter time. Um, I do like to try to give plants a really good resting period in the winter just so that it, when they focus on their growth in the spring and summer, it's going to be as healthy and robust as it can be. Um, so that's another reason why I don't like to fertilize in the winter time because you can technically encourage growth with fertilizer in the winter, but that growth is not going to typically be as strong or as fruitful as the growth that, that was in the spring and summer. Um, so with, like with the snake plant, if I was like really trying to get this guy to grow fast, um, 
and I was doing like excessive amounts of fertilizer when I shouldn't have been technically, you know, it's, you know, there's always a, a time period where a plant might need fertilizer, even though the general rule says that it wouldn't. Um, the, the leaves on these guys may get a little bit like skinnier. It won't be as compact and like full as it appears at the moment. There'll be a little bit more space between the leaves on plants like um, pothos and philodendrons, like the trailing vining kinds of plants. You'll find that um, in the winter time, the growth will tend to be a little bit more space between the leaves. Um, so trimming plants up as you're going into the winter also can really help to encourage a little bit more compact full growth as we're going into the spring and summer. Um, you can, it's really hard to root cuttings in the winter um, unless you really can keep the soil temperature around 65 and up. Um, and with the water, sometimes that can keep the soil a little bit cooler than the roots would actually want to be when you're trying to propagate. Um, so I haven't had as much, much success with propagating in the wintertime as I've had in the spring and summer just because the plants... Um, the tissues that create the new root systems are not really going to be as successful um, in the winter. It'll take like twice to three times as long for the same plant to develop roots and water as it would in the spring and summer. Um, so you can absolutely trim your plants back in the winter, not a prob, but the propagation aspect, unless you're doing a good amount of trying to keep them warm enough, may be a little bit less successful. Um, so that's just another thing to think about. I mean, it's always worth a try. I wouldn't like throw something away if it was a, a probable piece of a plant, but um, just whatever you want to do with it. You can have a lot of fun with these kinds of things. Amy, do you have some time to uh, answer a couple yes. questions? Great. All right. Um, first one is, that I saw uh, touching back was uh, that fern that you were holding up a while ago. What type of fern is that? So this one is called a blue star fern. I believe it's a type of a phlebodium. Um, it's a, a tropical fern that actually grows in the like dead fronds that hang off of palm trees. And so it'll just kind of like a spore will float through the air and land there. And then it'll just kind of like hang down pendulously off the side like this. Um, and these ones, they're really cool because they actually have a completely different adult structure to their fronds than the young ones. So the young ones are just this little like slip just going up straight like a dagger here. Um, the adult fronds will actually be very kind of fenestrated. So this one's got a little bit of lobing going on already. Um, this one is going to actually get very fingery as it keeps growing. Um, so I love these guys. They're super cool, very blue textured and colored. There's like a powder on the fronds as well um, that you can kind of rub off if you really try very hard. Um, and it just, it gives it that really iridescent blue sheen. I just, I really love it. Gotcha. Next one, we have a uh, person is asking about air plants. How do we care for an overwinter air plant? Yes. Um, so air plants, they can be pretty sensitive to um, the heat um, in the dry air in the home. So with the air plants, you really want to keep an eye on the humidity. You may have to um, mist a little bit more often. Um, I don't like to put them in completely closed cloches or anything like that because they do require pretty good airflow still to be able to absorb water into their systems. Um, so don't completely cover them, but you can put them in like like a little glass one that has like a large opening on the side will kind of keep localized humidity a little higher for the plant um misting if you're going like i typically go mist mine around once a week or so and then every second to third week i'll dunk it in water for about 30 minutes and then shake it off really good and then just put it right back um in the winter time the air is a lot drier so they're going to dry out quicker so it could be more of like a twice a week kind of misting situation um and then depending on the variety some air plants like less water than others i find that the really thick hard ones that are very firm like a little less water so you can go a little longer between mistings with those guys um whereas the really soft ones like the Ionanthas and the very um just very light kind of tissued plants that are air plants um, those guys will need a little bit more water because they're just they have a little bit less tissue to be able to hold on to that um, they also grow in areas that are a little bit more warm and humid anyway um, so that will impact them as well wonderful and we have a couple people asking about caladiums next yes in terms of how to overwinter the clay. Okay, okay, right, right. Um, so it'll be very similar to the elephant ears. Um, just you want to cut off any of the stems on the top of the bowl. Um, you would get, I like to get them just like out of the pot completely so you can see where the top of the stem comes out of the top of it. And then you can kind of just trim it or break it off just wherever it meets there. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, some of the outside of the bowl may even kind of like get a little torn in the process, but that it doesn't tend to hurt the bulb too much. It may, may get a little stunted when it starts to grow in the spring, but 
it'll very easily regrow from that. Um, and then, yeah, just keeping them in um, a very dark, dry place so that they don't try to grow out of season. Um, some people keep them in the same soil, but just put them in a very dark, dry area for the, um, the storage season, even like a closet people do sometimes, um, just to keep the bulbs from completely desiccating, but not to actually encourage any kind of growth. Um, so then when, once you go to put them out in the spring again, um, I've successfully done, just kept them in the pots and just literally not taken them out, not tried to store them, just put them in a dark, dry place, didn't water them until spring, and they regrew like crazy and did totally fine. Um, so just keeping an eye on them. Um, you, I, it's a good idea to get your finger down in the dirt sometimes and check and see if the bulb is still there. Um, Cause I have had ones that I've tried to overwinter that just ended up being an empty pot of dirt cause it just completely disintegrated in the soil. Cause I, I imagine the soil stayed a little too wet as I was going in to store them. You really want to make sure the soil is pretty dry when you go to store them. Um, so keep it out in like a, a warm space to dry out before you put it in the dark space first. Um, that'll also keep any kind of mushrooms at bay that could be hanging out in the uh, in the soil because they'll really thrive in that kind of dark environment too um but it's not the end of the world i mean mushrooms are very helpful for plants in the long run anyway all right we'll do one more question and then i'll let you get back to the rest of your spiel um but a bunch of people are asking about how to care for and overwinter their hibiscuses yes yes and i believe i saw one on um on citrus as well. So the hibiscus, any of the very, the very heavy flowering tropicals for outside, um, the citrus, all of those guys, um, you definitely are going to want to really look them over very well when you go to bring them inside for winter time. Or at least when it goes below 50 degrees at nighttime, just to keep them from getting any kind of shock. Um, but yeah, just keep them in the sunniest space that you have in the house. Um, so if you don't have a window that gets at least a few hours of direct sun during the day, you can supplement with grow lights, um, which are just um, artificial, you know, lights they can screw into any kind of light bulb situation you have typically, as long as it's a pretty high spectrum LED or fluorescent bulb that is going to greatly increase the available light to your plants. Um, so that really can help. I've had um, great success with the citrus and growing them indoors throughout the winter that way, as well as the hibiscus. Um, but when you first bring them in, definitely you want to check them over for any kinds of pests um, because those guys with that sweet sap and the, the heavy flowering on them, they're going to just be magnets for spider mites, for aphids, for mealybugs. Um, it's just going to be a big thing. So with hibiscus, I'm a big fan of using a systemic insecticide on them during the uh, winter time. And then if you leach the soil really well before you put them out again in the spring and summer, it's a little less of an issue with hurting the pollinators after you've done that. Um, one of my favorite ones is this guy, high yield systemic granules. Um, it's literally a kind of just granular powder that you would put in the top of the soil and then mix it in. If it's time for water, you can water it in. If it's um, moist already still, you can just mix it in with like a, a plastic fork or a chopstick. Um, and this guy, it absorbs into the plant system itself. And then whenever the bugs try to bite at it, it will actually help to kill them off very quickly. Um, so it keeps the bugs, if they're already on the plant, that even if you can't see them, um, and not spider mites, just true insects for this guy. Um, it'll keep them from being able to get into high populations once you bring them indoors. Um, I also have had success with these guys um, with using this on um, any kind of insects in the soil of your house plants as well. So like if you have a if you pick up your pot that was outside and you see like a bunch of like bugs on the bottom of it, um, brush off the ones you can see obviously, but there still probably will be some hiding in the soil and in the pot of the plant. Um, I don't tend to recommend repotting before you bring them inside just because it's going to further stress the plant that's already been in a very ideal situation going into a less ideal situation. You kind of want to mitigate the amount of stress they experience at one point in time. Um, but you can, you can definitely um, just do some of this guy in the soil if it's a, not a food producing plant and it's going to definitely keep control over any kind of insects that could be plant pests. Um, so for spider mites, um, I, you really can't use this because this is, they're not true insects. They are arachnids. Um, so this only will work against true insects. So like mealybugs, aphids, leaf hoppers, all of those kinds of guys, um, for spider mites, you can easily use this guy, which is called eight. Um, it's a really great spray product based on with uh, sulfur and pyrethrins, which are derived from chrysanthemums. Um, and it controls most bugs on indoor plants. It doesn't really have a smell. It's a spray. I would um, probably spray in an area where you don't have kids and pets around. It's Once it's dry, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, but this one is really good for most house plants. Um, now, I wouldn't, you can use these on citrus and that kind of thing. I tend to go for the most organic, natural thing I can for my citrus plants just because I am going to be 
eating the lemons and limes I get off of them. Um, so in that case, I like, I really love to use neem oil, um, which is just, this is just one of the products we have of neem. Um, we typically have multiple varieties of, the, um, of neem products in stock, um, but neem is an extract from a specific tropical tree um, that it's the seeds that they use that they, uh, extract it from, and it has kind of a, a citrusy smell to it, um, but it actually works as a smothering agent in addition to being antifungal and as a pesticide as well. Um, the neem itself actually kind of helps to make bugs not want to feed and reproduce as well. So even though you have to go through and spray multiple times with this guy, um, you actually can get really successful control with a completely organic product. Um, so this you can spray literally up to the day of harvest on your plants if you need to just give them a good rinse off before you go ahead and eat it it's in skincare products um so it is a very safe and natural thing to use as far as dealing with pests and any kind of fungal diseases on plants. Um, the only thing I would not use neem oil or um, horticultural oil on are gonna be ferns. They're just fronds, can't heavy, um, handle the heavy oils. Some orchids can be somewhat sensitive to neem. I've used it successfully on most of mine. Um, there are a wide variety of different ones, but some of them can be a little more sensitive. So do a little bit of research on that. Um, but this is one of my favorite things for just treating bugs outright because you can give it a really good spray once or twice this week, do it again the next week, and then you can really keep on top of any kind of bugs that will be on it. Um, and with plants like citrus that are so prone to spider mites, it's not really an if it's going to get them, it's probably a win. Um, it is a good idea to get into a regular sp spray schedule while they're indoors so that you can actually use, um, keep that under control so that you're not going to end up with like your fruits falling off your plant prematurely, um, which which definitely can happen when the citrus feel like they're under stress. Um, and the name of this guy, so this one is a, it's a Fertilome Neem, it's Natural Guard brand, um, but it's just Neem Concentrate. It's been mixed already, so it's straight up ready to spray out of the bottle. And then these guys I'll show a little closer to. So this is eight, it's by Bonide. And then this one's by High Yield. Bonide has one as well that I like just as much, um, but this is just a little easier for everyone to read with the huge font. I like them both, I will find, I have found that this one does dissolve a little less quickly than the Bonide brand Systemic does. Um, so this one, you do have to kind of mix in the soil a little bit more, but I like it because you can see that you've treated the plant, whereas the other, the Bonide one, it does dissolve pretty thoroughly into the soil. So it's a little harder to see if you've already checked it. Um, and with the Systemics, you only have to reapply every two months. So if you do that year round for like a house plant, um, you can have complete control against insects biting at it, um, which is really nice, really great against fungus gnats as well, which can be a really big problem in the winter if you're, uh, if you're continuing a regular watering schedule and the plants are using a little less, fungus gnats can be a really big problem that kind of comes up during this time of year. Um, so this guy, really great for that kind of thing. I have heard of people using neem from fungus gnats as well because they are feeding on the fungus that lives in the soil naturally, um, but I haven't found it to be as effective as something like one of these guys or the garden dust that you can also get at the plant clinic um, is another great thing for fungus gnats as well. All right. Um, so just touching again on the spider mites thing. So the citrus, definitely prone to them. Crotons. So this, these guys, these are beautiful plants. I really love them. They love their sun. They love their high humidity. Um, when you go to bring these guys indoors for the winter, you can expect them to drop quite a few leaves. Um, I, I typically find that they will need supplemental lighting if you don't have a really sunny spot for them because they just, they lose their color very rapidly if you're not giving them giving them enough sun. Um, they do have a naturally very kind of red, orange, yellow color to them, but in the winter they do tend to turn a little bit more green, yellow. Um, so that is completely normal for them when they're not getting as much sun as they were in the past. Um, and with these guys, they are extremely prone to spider mites. So definitely give these a good spray before you bring them inside during the winter time. Um, it might also be a good idea to give them, a, get them on a regular schedule just to maintain the, um, to keep the, the spider mite numbers down um, because it can really wreak havoc on them really pretty quickly. Um, signs of spider mites on these plants are going to be speckling across the leaves. It'll probably, it'll mostly be on the backs of the leaves because they like to be protected from rain. Um, so if I have a plant that's really, really infested with spider mites, I will hose it off really well, like in the sink, in the shower, outside if it's warm enough. Um, and then that'll physically remove a lot of the actual adult mites on the plant. And then you can go through with your oil spray or your uh, eight, which is really great too. Um, and then that's going to take out any eggs that could be remaining and adults that weren't washed off. 
off. Um, so that also helps the dust plants very well. Putting plants in the shower for watering in the wintertime really helps to kind of clean their leaves, keep them from getting any kind of like blocked pores going on and just really help to keep pests at bay as well. You can, um, a hard enough water blast can rinse away quite a few bugs on plants. Um, but yeah, so the crotons, definitely keep an eye out on about the spider mites for those guys. Another one to worry about um, is the calatheas, marantas. Um, any of these guys are very prone to spider mites as well. So definitely get these, check these guys regularly in the winter time. Um, this one's a really cute one called Freddy. I just think they're really cute. The striping on them is adorable. I've also heard it's a type of pinstripe. It's not the ornata, but it's a type of one. Um, but they're just, they're super sweet. Um, the mites on these guys, they, so these guys have a pretty fibrous root system. Um, and when they get any kinds of pests or their, the humidity isn't high enough in the home, which is typically going on in the wintertime, unfortunately, um, they will literally drop every single leaf they have and then just resort to their stores in their, um, their tuberous root system. Um, so with these guys, if the plant's looking really, really terrible, it is a good idea. Just go ahead and cut off every single leaf, put the whole thing in a big old plastic bag, give it a good spray down with oil if you felt like it had mites, um, and then just let it sit in that warm little mini greenhouse to be able to regrow. Um, and I've seen them regrow pretty quick that way with doing that, just because it creates an instantly humid environment with no drafts, um, and it's the ideal situation for them to be able to regrow in the wintertime, especially when it's kind of dry and not as warm as it would be in other times of the year. Oh, right. Um, we went over a little bit on repotting. Um, definitely, like if the plant is not going to make it through the season without repotting, go ahead and repot it. Um, my general rule of thumb, again, is not to repot during the winter just for like aesthetic reasons. Um, it, so like if the plastic pot, I mean, it's not super fancy, I understand. I like to just set it down in a different catch pot so that you're kind of faking that it's planted in at the moment. Um, and then when it comes time for springtime, if the roots are really getting packed in there, you're having to water like extremely often to keep it happy, then you can go up in size and pot it directly into the pot of your choice. Um, so for the winter, when in doubt, best to wait it out is what I like to tell people. Um, just because you can always repot later, um, but a plant going through transplant shock in the winter time is just a lot less likely to regrow as healthily as it did before or anywhere near as quickly as it could have. Um, so I tend to give it at least like a month or so in the home. And then if I really feel like it needs repotting still, then I can go ahead and do that. Um, but just keep an eye that you're trying to keep everything very stable for it moving forward after that point. So not to stress it out too, too much. So I've got a gardenia plant here as well. Um, this is definitely one of the plants that you would want to spray pretty hardcore before you go ahead and bring it inside for the winter. Um, now these are zone eight hardy, so people can grow these a couple hours south from us outside in the ground, um, but in pots they will not last the winter outside for us in this area unfortunately. Um, so these can be kind of hard to grow sometimes just because they are so temperamental. Um, they do require an acidic kind of pH. Um, so for these guys, you may have to do a little bit of supplemental fertilizing in the winter time just to keep the pH proper. Um, so if you notice the leaves are turning a very light green, they're looking a little bit yellow, um, then you will definitely want to keep an eye on the, uh, the acidity of the soil. Um, so you can do that with a pH test. Um, you can bring leaves in, we can take a look at them and just identify that that's what's going on. Um, but a little bit of acidic fertilizer for acidic loving plants um, will go a long way as far as keeping these guys healthy in the winter time. Um, now I wouldn't fertilize super often in order to try to get it to bloom in the winter. They can technically bloom year round, um, but unless you're doing supplemental lighting or you have a greenhouse situation for these guys, don't expect them to flower throughout the winter time because their main season is spring through summer. Um, so I like to just really, if they're getting overgrown, give them a really good cutback. Um, you can do the same thing with citrus if you're trying to shape them as well during this time before they're going to their full fruiting and flower season because we're going into that for the citrus. Um, cut them back, give them a really good spray down, they do, they are pretty thirsty plants. So if necessary, you could go up in size a little bit for these guys, go ahead and um, repot them, go up a little bit, um, or you could wait till spring if it's not like really busting at the root system. Um, but yeah, these guys, they're just gonna be a little more sensitive. So just keep an eye on them, make sure their pH is proper still. Um, high humidity is kind of a need and then a regular spray schedule to keep the, uh, the mites and mealybugs under control for these guys indoors will really be helpful long-term. Um, 
And another thing about any kind of oil spray that we're spraying on any plants, um, when you spray a neem or a cultural oil, it's going to act kind of like suntan oil. So when you put a plant directly in direct sun, it can actually burn the leaves if you don't wait like 24 to 48 hours. Um, so I like to, when I spray a plant, um, bright and direct light, totally fine, but keep it out of a full sun situation for at least I would say 28 to 48 hours. Um, and that's gonna make sure that the plant can absorb in some of that oil in its pores and it's not going to just sit on top of it and just create a total sun slick where it can create burn spots. All oh, right. So I think we've gone over most of what I wanted to talk about. Um, two more things I didn't really address at the moment are the, um, the cyclamen. So this beautiful little guy here, this is a really fun little wintertime house plant. Um, and these are alpine plants in nature. Um, so they really thrive in cooler temperatures. Um, so this is one of the plants that you really would want to grow in a cooler kind of window situation, whereas you may have had Windowsill, um, and they really actually can't tolerate temperatures above 80 degrees or so. Um, so in greenhouses, they really don't tend to last very long because they just it gets too warm for them. Um, but in the normal house situation near a drafty window, these guys will thrive all winter long. They can bloom all winter. Um, one thing to note about them is that they do naturally have um, and not always, but can easily harbor cyclamen mites, um, which don't tend to really hurt the cyclamen unless it's under stress, um, but they will really devastate African violets or any other Gisneriads very quickly. Um, so if you have cyclamen in the house, keep them very separate, not even in the same watering trays as your African violets, because those can go over and ruin those guys really quick. The, the center will completely dry up on the African violets from these mites. Um, so these guys, phenomenal. Just keep them separate from your violets and you will have a beautiful winter house plant. Um, I'm not sure what the specific variety of this one's called, but it's just, it's got the prettiest little heart shaped leaves and they, they come in a variety of different leaf textures, colors, blooms, pinks, reds, purples. They're just super, super cute little alpine guys. Um, and this is one that will go completely dormant for half of the year, um, but it's typically always in the summertime. So going into like April or May, you may find that all the leaves fall off this plant. You can literally just put it in a bag, put it in a dark spot, and then just restart watering it in the wintertime in the fall. And then it'll just really just turn right back into a full plant again. Um, you can actually grow quite a few of these outside as well, but they will die back for the spring and summer, and then they'll pop right back up in the winter. All right. And then the last one is the Norfolk Island pine here. Um, this is a really cool plant that grows on an island off the coast of Australia called Norfolk Island. Um, and they really don't experience temperatures below 50 or above 80 ever. Um, they're a really great timber tree, actually. You get a lot of wood from these guys because they're very fast growing. Um, and they're not actually a true pine whatsoever. They're Araucaria is their gen genus. Um, but these really love that chillier spot as well. So if you have a really sunny spot, but it's pretty drafty, kind of cold, um, this is a really great plant for that kind of this time of the year because they have a cute little kind of wintry tree kind of look. Um, but they're super easy to grow. Um, they tend to use an even amount of moisture pretty much year round. Um, they don't really like high temperatures, so they're just a really great plant to kind of move around the house for spaces that are a little draftier than other plants would like. Super cute. You can also decorate them for the holidays, which is awesome. All right. And so let's step into some more questions. All right. Uh, first and foremost, uh, can you go over real quick those three um, products that you had highlighted again? Uh, some people wanted to make sure and some of them couldn't see. Yeah, so this one is, it's the Natural Guard Fertile Loam Neem. It says for organic gardening and pretty much the only ingredient is um, neem oil. It's pretty great stuff, citrusy smelling, um, but I, some of them smell a little bit more pungent than others. I like the smell of this one though. I find it to be kind of pleasant to be honest. So that's that guy. Um, and any brand really of neem oil is, is okay. You don't have to go with this one. Um, I haven't found one that I really did not like. I will say some of them smell a little more pungent than others, just depending, but um, I haven't found that one is more effective than the others, as long as it's mixed to the correct ratio. Um, you can also get the concentrates of the neem oils, and then you can mix it up in your own spray bottles if you want to have a lot on store as well. And then this guy is one of the Bonide products called Eight Insect Control for the Home and Garden. 
And this is for use on house plants, roses, flowers, ornamental trees, shrubs, fruits, nuts, and veggies. Um, so you can definitely use this for a wide variety of things. And it is um, the actual ingredient in it is sulfur and pyrethrins, um, which are both totally safe to use and become inert pretty much after about 24 to 48 hours on the plant. It's that guy. And then this is the high yield systemic granules. And Bonide has a, also has a version of the, I think it's called a systemic houseplant control. Um, but this is, it's a powder kind of thing. So it'll make like a, a sound if you shake it like a shaker. Um, and then this we would mix into the soil itself and then water it in once it's time for water. And then this one, you do not want to use on food producing plants um, just because it is based on with the active ingredients in metacloprid, um, which can, it, it is technically toxic in water systems around and you wouldn't want to eat plants that have been treated with it heavily. Um, but it is totally safe for use on house plants, ornamentals, plants that aren't flowering that you don't put it outside for the summertime. Um, and I just, it's really helpful in getting rid of large infestations of mealybugs. Um, and those are just, yeah, it can be, <laughs> it can be hard to get rid of that, those guys in scale sometimes. Um, the last plant I had talked about was the Norfolk Island pine, this guy. And it's, um, it's spelled N-O-R-F-O-L-K, island, and then pine. They're super cute. You can find them a lot of places this, um, going into this time of the year too, because they're just, they're super awesome and people like to decorate them. All right. Uh, next person, uh, sorry, not, not next person, but a lot of people were asking about banana plants and how to overwinter yes. banana plants. Right. Um, so the tropical bananas, um, those you would definitely want to bring inside once it goes below 50 or so at nighttime. Um, and then just the sunniest spot you have for them. They're still a pretty water heavy plant. Um, I have found that they're a little bit prone to aphids indoors as well. Um, mealybugs sometimes too. So keep an eye on those guys on the new growth in particular is where all those sap sucking bugs like to hang out. Um, and then you can, you can technically chop them back, um, in the winter. And I mean, for the, uh, the winter time, if you want to, um, some people choose to store the roots just in like in the garage, they'll chop all the foliage off down to the, almost to the base of the trunk, honestly. Um, and then just keep watering it like once a month, just to keep the roots from completely desiccating. Um, and then they put them back outside and it just completely regrows from a new growth point in the spring. Um, but you can also grow them as a house plant indoors year round. Um, they do get pretty big. Um, but so if, size is an issue, then I would probably cut it back. But if it's still manageable in the house, you can just grow it as a house plant, just keep up with the watering. They're still pretty thirsty. It'll be a little less often just because it's not going to be as windy and the heat and everything. Um, and then for hardy banana plants, those guys, they will, um, you want to plant those in the ground outside. Ideally, they've had about a month or a few months to get their roots situated in the ground. And then those will completely die back come first frost. So once we hit like under 32 degrees or even close there for nighttime, periods, um, then those are really just going to completely turn to mush, just collapse onto the ground. And then the bulbs are just going to be in the ground still. And then I just, what I typically do is just do a pretty heavy layer of mulch on the top, just maybe about two inches thick or so. Um, and then just the regular rain that the winter, you know, it's the spring and, and the snow and everything that's going to be falling, right? Rain in the winter is a little higher around here than other places. Um, they're totally fine. You really don't have to worry about those guys in the ground. Um, fertilize them come springtime just with a granular kind of fertilizer, but they will come back just as hard as ever with probably multiple new heads come up as well. You can also divide them once they go die back as well. Um, so like if you see like there had already been two heads, you can go through and like dig out the bulb in the ground and then move it to somewhere else um, to come back in the springtime too, which is kind of fun. All right. So uh, an another group of people is wondering about uh, bougainvilleas and mm -hmm. then also what type of fertilizer they should be using with them. And if you have any uh, fertilizer like with the number ratio, what you'd recommend. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the bougainvilleas, they're, they're one that's a, a little easier to overwinter provided that you are putting it in a really sunny spot year round still. Um, so I have not heard of people having too much success with like putting them in like the garage or, like, or a dark place and trying to store them that way because they tend to just exhaust their own energy stores. Um, but the bougainvilleas, they're a little prone to spider mites and mealybugs. Um, so keep an eye on those guys as far as pests are concerned. Um, I do recommend kind of cutting those guys back pretty hard when you go to bring them in just because they are a very like 
fast growing vining kind of plant. Um, so to keep it under control, you can cut them back pretty much as much as you need to, um, just to be able to bring them inside and then give them a pretty sunny spot still. Um, they do like misting pretty regularly, so that'll help to keep them from losing too much moisture through their leaves. Um, fertilizer, ideally, I like like a 10-15-10 like a or so, They're pretty even, but a little higher of the middle number for adequate bloom production. Um, and I really only would fertilize these guys in the winter if they're going to be in a pretty warm, semi-greenhouse sunroom kind of situation, and they're trying to actively produce flowers. Um, if it's still just kind of green leaves or even doesn't have very many leaves, um, I probably wouldn't fertilize until springtime just to not try to encourage growth that is less stable and healthy as the spring-summer growth. Um, but if it's actively blooming, going crazy, going into the winter time, they can technically bloom me around sometimes, um, then you can totally give it some fertilizer, but I wouldn't go once a month or anything like that. I would probably go like very sparingly small amounts just to keep the leaves from developing actual nutrient deficiencies. Um, but an even fertilizer, you can even do a 10-10-10 for those guys or a 20-20-20. Um, the middle number being higher, the phosphorus is going to produce the most flowers out of these guys, um, but they don't really have a super particular pH that they like to stick to. They're very uh, kind of like a neutral, maybe slightly acidic pH. So if your soil is peat moss based, you're pretty much good to go. All right. Uh, one customer is wondering about their peace lily. Um, they've had a lot of growth. Should they continue to water it uh, heavily? Um, and uh, um, just any care that needs to be done for overwintering? Yeah, so I've got a uh, peace lily right here that I did not really talk about quite yet. Um, this girl, so they have really big root systems. So especially if you recently bought one or if it's been in the same pot for a while, if you can't get your finger like easily down into the pot. Um, just give it a little wiggle and see how the roots are doing. So like this one here, she's pretty pot bound. Her roots are really kind of, they're reaching the bottom. They're starting to wrap a little bit. At this point, I probably would go up in size for this girl just because they tend to use a pretty large amount of water compared to other plants year round. Um, so with this one, I'd probably go up into at least an eight inch pot size to get her through the winter or also tend to use a similar amount of water year round, but it will probably be slightly less if you're keeping them in the same spot. Um, if you're moving them to a little bit of a brighter spot to try to encourage blooms or that kind of thing, um, then it may need a little bit more watering just because it's going to be using a little more to try to subsist. Um, but yeah, it's the peace lilies, um, if they're Putting up new flowers, you can fertilize to help to keep them healthy. Um, with all the tropicals, if they're throwing out tons of active growth, then it is okay to give them a little bit of light fertilizer um, because at that point, the plant's happy, it's growing, it's using up its nutrients with healthy new growth. Um, at that point, you can do a little bit of fertilizer, but I wouldn't try to fertilize to try to get a plant to grow in the winter time, um, just because it's not gonna produce the healthiest growth for the long term of the plant. Uh, going away from the overwintering for a second, someone was wondering about, uh, they had saw what they thought was a rubber tree plant, um, but was told that it was a ficus. Is a rubber tree plant a ficus? It is, yes. So there's actually, there's multiple types of rubber trees. So the rubber tree that people used to get um, most of the world's rubber from, I think a lot of it's synthetic at this point, but natural rubber is technically a different plant from the ficus rubber tree. Um, the natural rubber plant is, it's a much, I mean, I would say it's a much larger growing tree because the ficus can get to be like a hundred feet tall, um, but they're massive, massive trees with massive trunks. Um, and those, um, it's, I can't remember the exact genus at the moment. I know it starts with an H. Um, but those guys, they tend to produce like got 10 times as much actual rubber sap than the ficus rubber trees do. Um, so you could technically tap one of the, uh, an, a very old um, ficus rubber tree and get latex sap out of it to, that you can make with rubber yourself. Um, it's just not as high of a yield though. So it's not the one that people typically would use historically for rubber production. Um, however, it is entirely possible as all ficus have a lot of latex as their sap. Um, the rubber trees are a little bit I think they call them the rubber trees because the, the leaves themselves feel like they may be made out of rubber. It's a very waxy kind of leaf. Um, they have very obvious pores that sometimes kind of like, you can see the, the hard minerals kind of secreting out of them and it'll form like a little stain on the pore on the top of the leaf. Um, so I think that's probably why they're called rubber plants. 
um, because they're very similar. You can still tap them for the latex the same way that, that they tap the real rubber trees from. Um, but yeah, they are um, they are indeed a ficus. Um, ficus robusta is one of the, uh, the like kind of a green original rubber plant. Um, ficus elastica is the true name for the rubber plant as far as the species name. Wonderful. Uh, next plant on the list, a bunch of people are asking about um, uh, monsteras, mm -hmm. how we mm -hmm. could overwinter monsteras. Yes. Um, so those guys, I, I've had most success with growing mine in like eastern window pretty much year round. Um, I do have one that's pretty heavily variegated and I do grow that one in all, it's like in between an east and southern window for the winter time, just to give it enough light that it maintains variegation. Um, but for the most part, if it's if it's one of the all green ones, or like you know even with like the pothos and philodendrons that are partially variegated, um, morning sun is totally adequate to get them through the winter. Um, they tend to be a little; they're pretty tolerant of drafts and that kind of thing as well. Um, the main thing with the monsteras is that their growth is going to slow down pretty significantly and they're going to be using a lot less water. Um, so if you were going about every two weeks between water waterings or even every 10 days, you're probably going to be about every two to three weeks, maybe even four for a really large pot size in the winter time. Um, just making sure that the, the soil's dry, drying all the way down the pot. You're checking for any kind of coolness. If you get your finger down in there compared to body temperature, it still kind of feels cool. Let it go a little drier. Um, and that's just kind of the main thing is letting them take a a true resting period. Most of the aeroids, um, monsteras, philodendrons, pothos, peace lilies, anthuriums, we do like to be able to just kind of relax during the winter months and not be forced to do any excessive growth um, just because they've usually spent a lot of energy putting out a lot of leaves and doing a lot of upward growth during the other previous seasons. Um, but they're super easy to maintain otherwise. And I just saw I had another uh, question on Mandevilla care for indoors. Um, those guys they tend to be, they're a pretty rambly vine. Um, so I do like to cut those back pretty significantly when you're bringing them in. Um, most successful winter overwintering is going to be in like a sunroom kind of situation or just a really sunny window that you have indoors. Um, I do definitely like to treat those with the systemic insecticides or at least neem oil, just because they are very prone to sap sucking bugs like mealybugs. Um, so I would even, if I'm growing that one indoors year round for the winter, might even put that in a room that's not next to other plants that are prone to those kinds of insects. Um, just because they can be such an issue on those guys because they're just they're so sweet. Um, flowering will be very minimal, if at all, during the winter time. Um, so I probably would hold off on fertilizer unless you're noticing that the leaves are really getting kind of sallow, kind of yellowy looking all the way around, and that could be a nitrogen deficiency. Um, Typically, I don't worry about repotting them when I go to bring them in, even if they're very root bound, because I know I'm going to have to probably go up in size when I put them back out in the spring to be able to keep enough moisture at the root ball at that point. Um, so cut it back pretty good. Withhold on fertilizer unless it's actually getting a nutrient deficiency sign. Um, and then just continue as much sun as possible. Um, and you'll probably notice a lot more leaf growth, if at all, during the winter. Um, but the uh, the, when you go to move it back outside for in the spring and summer again, the, the, it's just going to just explode with new growth. So at that point, start fertilizing, you can repot, um, and then you're good to go. All right. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, okay. Next next plant that people are asking about for overwintering are geraniums. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So geraniums are pretty easy to overwinter, to be honest. Um, the main thing is that they really still like a good amount of sun during the winter time. Um, so as tropicals, um, they, they really don't like have a, they're not a true annual. They're not just going to go to seed flower and then die. Um, they do kind of flower year round in nature, but the sun is just not going to be really strong enough unless you're supplementing with a grow light or have like a really great sunroom kind of situation to get them to bloom year round. Um, but they definitely can just be brought in as like a foliage kind of house plant. Um, I have seen sometimes that like aphids can be a problem on them so you may want to give them a spray down before you bring them in just to keep them from getting on other plants at all um but yeah you can you can cut them back pretty significantly as well um they propagate pretty quick so if you need to make the plant fuller after you could trim it back you can do it in water or soil pretty easy as well um and then yeah so the, the flowering it, it'll probably be kind of here and there um if you notice nutrient like deficiency signs like yellowing of leaves or just lots of leaves dropping off all the time um it could possibly need to go up in size a little bit because they do kind of have a little bit of a 
an even moisture requirement. Um, but they tend to be pretty easy. Begonias are another one that you can overwinter indoors. Um, they do like a little bit of a higher humidity situation than the geraniums per se. Um, so that's the only thing that I really like to worry about. Um, seem to worry about when I do begonias going to bring them inside is they tend to kind of get a little bit of a crispier leaf issue sometimes. Um, but you can easily chop those guys back too, or even grow them the, the cuttings you that you could chop back hydroponically for the winter and then pot them up um, in regular soil and then just put them right back in the yard come spring. Great. All right. Um, I think we have time for one more. Um, people were asking about gardenias. Oh no, you already did gardenias, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, I've talked about a little bit, um, but I'll, I'll recap again. It's not a problem at all. Um, so the main thing with these is they're really prone to bugs. So make sure you're treating them. Um, you can do systemics, um, make sure to leach it before you put it out again in the springtime, try to get all that out of the soil, protect pollinators. Um, but definitely some like neem oil. Um, there's a bunch of products for roses that you can get too that are very, very, um, very effective on gardenias as far as pest control and diseases as well. Um, sap sucking bugs, aphids, spider mites are their magnets for those guys. Mealybugs, scale, they're magnets for pretty much all of them. Um, so really pest control is the main thing with the gardenias when you're going to be bringing them indoors. Um, watering will be a little less than you would be outside because they, they're a pretty thirsty plant on average, but they definitely um, do like even moisture for the most part. Um, if you're noticing a lot of yellowing, um, it could be a watering related thing or spider mites. Um, but I haven't found that they're too hard. I even successfully overwintered mine just in my garage getting indirect grow lights. It wasn't directly under, I'm just getting indirect ones and it didn't grow at all in the winter. And it kind of, you know, dropped a few leaves in the process, but it's a, a phenomenally beautiful plant all this past spring and summer. And just with even that kind of minimal care situation in the winter time. Um, so they're just, I really like them. They can be high maintenance. It might be a plant you have to kind of slave over sometimes, but they're, uh, the, the fragrance is just, overwhelmingly fantastic and they're just they're a really fun plant to really see thrive especially after if you put a lot of work into it too all right great well it is now one o'clock so we've uh we've gone through our allotted hour uh so i want to thank you amy for all your time and your knowledge uh, here today i know a lot of people got a uh Got their questions answered, but a lot of people also uh, still did not. And if you guys did not get the questions answered that you needed to, uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, on our website, maryfieldgardencenter.com, or you can also send um, Sally your questions at sburrows at mgcmail.com. I uh, hope that everybody had a great time today. Uh, I know I did, and I hope you too. <laughs> did as well, Amy. Um, so until next time, our next uh, webinar is going to be this coming Tuesday. Um, and then we'll have our other webinar on Thursday, as well as David's final um, plant clinic for the season before we start going into Christmas on Thursday as well. Um, so everybody have a wonderful day and a, and a good weekend. All right. Bye, everyone.